We're sitting down with ESPN senior writer Jeff Legwald. The Leggy 100 is out as the uh, draft is right around the corner here. Uh, how was the process this year putting that out? Well, you know, Phil, this is a unique draft because this is one of the biggest draft class in terms of gradable players that I can remember uh, in my 30 some years of doing this uh, because of the COVID seasons. You have a lot of 24 year old, 25 year old players in this draft. And, uh, you know, again, it's anecdotal uh, evidence, but I, I believe there are more like 40 game, 50 game players in this draft than we've seen in decades. And Kobe Bryant, the University of Cincinnati corner, is a 63 game player. I've never seen a player with 60 games on his resume coming out of college football. And Bryant played 63 games. Is that a good thing for NFL teams? Because there's more tape to evaluate, but I, I would imagine teams want guys in their building younger. Yeah, you know, I think it's flipped. When, when juniors and, and redshirt sophomores first started coming into the draft, it was always, oh, we like seniors, we like four-year players. And now this year you're hearing a lot of, well, he is 25, so by the time, if you take him in the first round, by the time you get to the end of that fifth year, you might have a 30-year-old player uh, up for free agency. So I, I think it does impact some, but the, just the sheer numbers of those players in this draft is they're going to get selected because they're some of the best players on the board. Let's talk about quarterbacks a little bit here. Yep. Your top quarterback was Malik Willis. Yep. I believe he was number 29. By an eyelash. Uh, I really came to like Desmond Ritter as well from Cincinnati. Those two guys were clearly my top two quarterbacks. I think Ritter uh, I think Ritter will surprise people as he becomes a pro and moves on. But Willis is is there because of the sheer upside. What he could be five years from now is so much more than he is right now. And and I really, in talking to him, I really enjoyed his makeup, his approach, uh, how he how he viewed the game, what he knew. I, I think he I think he and Ritter both wowed teams when they got on the board and and were quizzed. I always have the quarterbacks lower because I put them where teams really put them. Quarterbacks are always overdrafted. Even the teams that take them in the top 10 often don't have them really graded in the top 10. They just know their quarterbacks. And you, you know, I've always said there are two boards. There's a quarterback board and there's everybody else. But there, there's not that uh, top, top right. uh, consensus number one quarterback type of player in this year's draft. Or right? even a player consensus. Yeah. And I think that's why the top 10 could be really unique. They're, you know, It'll, it'll be interesting to watch because I think teams are all over the board. Some teams like, you know, these five players of the top five, and you'll get an entirely different top five if you talk to, to other teams. So I, I think the top ten could be really sort of nutty on draft night and, and probably a, a, a trade in there somewhere if, if somebody really, really wants one of those quarterbacks. The Broncos had a top ten pick. <laughs> then they made the big trade of the offseason for Russell Wilson. Uh, a good position for the Broncos to be in, not having to sweat it out over some of these quarterbacks? Well, I think if you get, you know, the Denver Broncos' first round selection in this draft was Russell Wilson, so it turned out pretty good for him. <laughs> so uh, if you can get a player like Wilson uh, and, and still keep nine picks in hand, which they did, I think the real price tag is next year because they only have four picks right now. But nine picks in this draft and those picks are in the sweet spot of this draft you could get a, a player in this draft graded at 63 64 65 that player may carry the same grade as the player you have at 80 or a very similar grade so you that's really where you want to be in this draft it's really strong in day two and the beginning of day three and they have five picks in the uh, first 116 so you know if they do as well as they did last year with that class, they could get three or four real contributors uh, out of those five initial picks. You mentioned last year's class. Uh, George Payton, the personnel department, won a little award that mm -hmm. was given out at the Combine for the top draft class. What do you think about the job that uh, George has done here? Well, you know, you can tell he came up through the scouting ranks. Very detailed approach, uh, very organized approach, and I think the one thing they've that they did last year and will be important moving forward uh, and that can be difficult is matching your draft picks to what your coaches want in a player and you know I know when we talked to George a few days ago I, I did specifically ask him how important was it for you to learn what the 
the new coaching staff wants in players. And that's how you get contributors. You, it's one thing to like a player, but if you take him and you don't have a place for him, then it's really tough for that guy to be a contributor. So, you know, where's, where's the mistake there? Is it in picking the player or in trying to develop them in your system? So that, that's the one thing I think he did really well last year. And if they keep doing it that well, you're always going to have players come out of the draft who, who play for you immediately. And that's also how you stay healthy with the salary cap. You know, the teams that have more draft picks who play and contribute for multiple years are always healthier against the salary cap. Yeah, I, I mean, like picking an offensive lineman this year, much different than last year uh, mm -hmm. uh, for the Broncos. Looking at this draft, what's the top position? What, where's the biggest strength in this year's class? Well, again, I think uh, the Broncos are okay there because corner is a very strong position. They need more depth there. Uh, edge rusher is a very strong position in this draft. They could use at least one more, I think, uh, so immediately the two need spots per se are two of the strongest spots on the board. I think wide receiver will forever be a strong category in every draft now just because of the way college football has gone. Uh, that's another strong position. And I think there's some tackles that can be found in late day two, day three, who you could potentially get a right tackle out of that equation. Uh, the last one for you here, Leggy, is just the, the top of the class. You have Evan Neal, yep. the tackle uh, from Alabama, but some other guys, like you mentioned, uh, like some other players there. Uh, how do you expect night one to go? Is it going to be crazy? Well, I think everybody wonders. I think Carolina is kind of the first big question to answer at number what are they at six. And I think everybody wonders, are you going to trade that pick? Because now they're, they're putting off all kinds of vibes that they may not want a quarterback and uh, I think they'd really like somebody to come up and get that pick uh, and they'd still get the player they really value. But I think that's the first team to watch. And I think an awful lot of people in the league that I've talked to, uh, the Steelers at 20 are another sort of question over the first round because everyone knows they'd like a quarterback in that slot. Everyone also knows, you know, my last year covering the Steelers was 1993 and they still are using the same draft profiles because they don't have any turnover and they don't trade very often on draft day. So they're at 20, they'd like a quarterback. So everybody below them or teams that want a quarterback are wondering what they will do. It helps when uh, Mike Tomlin has been there forever. Yeah. They have the consistency. Uh, how many did you get right last year of your top 100? I, I know it's always in the 90. It was a little, no, never. If you could get 90, that would be, you'd be doing better than teams, I think. <laughs> Uh, I think last year was an 83. I think my best ever is an 89. Okay. So that's, you know, again, it's you do, you do what you do, but, you know, teams are all over the place. So it only takes a few guys to knock the dominoes over. Seems like this year is really, you, know, you don't know what you're going to get, huh? Yeah, I think, I think once you get to the 60s this year, uh, I think you'll see a wide variety of picks from teams. You're, I think you'll, you'll hear on the, on the coverage, uh, well, you know, that guy wasn't in the projections here or there. I think you will have some players really surprised. I always kind of keep an eye on, you know, who's the first non-combine player off the board. I, I think this year that may be a, a defensive lineman named Eric Johnson from Missouri State. So, but that's always one for me to watch. And, and I think more quarterbacks will end up going on, on day two than, than people think. Okay, it should be a, a wild Thursday, Friday, and Saturday coming up. Jeff, I always appreciate your Broncos <laughs> coverage and really enjoy the leggy 100. Anytime.